appreciate the speaking slot right after Paul and just before lunch. It's a good place to be. Um, and uh, good to be back at the Diamonds and Canvas. I'm always given a chance to reintroduce people to North Arrow or, or make an initial introduction to the, to the work that we've been doing on our exploration projects in Canada. We are an exploration company, so I'll certainly be making some forward-looking statements on the kind of things that we'd like to do. I'll get the uh, corporate information out of the way first. This is uh, the current corporate structure and the main takeaways. We have about 93 million shares outstanding. Standing. Uh, we're listed on the TSO Venture Exchange based in Vancouver, so very much a pretty typical Canadian junior explorer. I think uh, the takeaway from, from this slide is uh, as part of the shareholder base, um, insiders and directors of management have a very significant ownership interest in the company at just almost 24% as well as we have a, a few other key shareholders that are really important in supporting a company, particularly in, in more challenging markets like this, um, allows us to keep advancing uh, our, our projects and then moving forward with, with our, our ideas. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the people involved, um, but our, our group, our, our management group and our, our, our directors have a lot of experience in the diamond space. We've had a lot of success in finding diamond deposits and evaluating them and developing them uh, into producing assets in North America and in Africa. And to sort of a point to that, I think at last year's uh, symposium, Ren and Ira were, were on, on the, the hot seat for the fireside chat and then we're just going to hear after lunch from Chris Jennings on our board uh, with the keynote address here again. So I think that does point to the, the level of expertise and the depth of experience that our group has in the work that we're doing. Another way to look at it, I did show this slide here last year and I think it's still relevant. So uh, it's, this shows uh, North America, all the diamonds or all of the, the Kimberlite fields that were, were known in North America up to 2013. Uh, the yellow diamonds in particular were the discoveries that were made after 1980. So that, they would include all of the currently producing uh, mines in Canada. Since 2013, there's been an, an additional six Kimberlite fields discovered in the country. Four of them have been found by producing companies, so by Deers, by Rio, and by Stornoway. And two of the six were, discoveries were made by North Arrow. That are our Piku project in Saskatchewan, which is number one here, and then more recently our, our Mel Diamond Discovery up on the Melville Peninsula in Newnham. Both are significantly diamond at first Kimberlite. We're the only junior company to have made discoveries of new Kimberlite fields over the last six years. I've used that time frame because that's the time frame that North Arrow has been doing what we're doing. So we've had success on on the exploration and discovery side of things. If we look at our, our overall portfolio, our most advanced project is called Now Yet. It's, in, uh, it's located in Nunavut, and I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about our plans there and the work that we've done at Now Yet. Our other discovery stage projects include Mel and, uh, and Piku in Saskatchewan. Um, also include two projects that we have in the Lac de region of the Northwest Territories. Our Loki project, this time last year, we announced the discovery of the 465 Kimberlite. At the time, it was the first new Kimberlite discovery in the Lac de Gras region in, in the preceding five years. So making discoveries not just of new Kimberlite fields, but also on brownfields areas. Our partner on the LDG joint venture uh, project, which is immediately adjacent to Loki, which is south of the Diabic mine, is, uh, is Dominion Diamonds. Dominion is going to be uh, initiating a drill program there the week after next, so we're going to have some exposure to some exploration drilling on that project through July and, uh, and into August, hopefully. Uh, so we have a number of projects, but I, I am going to focus primarily on, on now yet. And, uh, and the reason for that is I think within the current context and the current market, we uh, conducted a drill program about last year, found new Kimberlite field, not a lot of recognition in the market. And I think it's just not giving us that sort of, uh, that, that, that sort of bump that we look for typically in a more normal market circumstance for making discoveries, for finding diamonds. So we're renewing our focus on now yet because it's a significant inventory of diamonds in a really, really good location and we have a very clear path forward on what it is we need to do next uh, on the project. And the key thing that we need to do is to, to get a better understanding on the valuation and the size distribution of the population of, of fancy uh, orangey, yellow and yellow diamonds that are in this deposit. So the deposit I'm talking about is the Q104 Kimberlite. You can see it here on this image, uh, that sort of the green blob in the, in the upper part. It is uh, it's a large inventory of diamonds. There's over 20 million carats in the ground, um, just down to about 200 meters below surface. I'll show you that we think it's a whole lot bigger than that as well. It's located uh, within the hamlet of Nauya. So it's very close to the community of Nauya on this image. So we're only about eight kilometers from tidewater, which means freight costs to get materials here, we think would be about half the cost of getting materials to the, the Lac de diamond deposits. So that's a significant advantage in, in exploration, and then also ultimately when we project forward to a, a potential development scenario. I just want to talk about this with the size of the deposit. 
it's about 12 hectares in size. We're looking for the initial 200 meters. We're looking at a strip ratio. Um, we play around with hints and how it, and how it might look of less than two to one. Um, our access is about to improve. The hamlet of Naoya is uh, a lead proponent on a, on a proposal to construct an access trail from their existing road network off to the northeast of the hamlet itself. Um, we're an enthusiastic supporter of that concept. Um, it will bring the road within a kilometer and a half of the Kimberlite, and uh, we're helping the hamlet with some of the engineering studies, some of the archaeological work that's happening, um, and also in identifying funding pools of, of money that's available at the territorial and the federal level to help them construct that, uh, that trail. And in this current environment, with the current government, there certainly are pools of money available for infrastructure development in the north. Anything that can be seen through the lens of indigenous reconciliation is important, and economic development in the north is a real hot button topic. And, and there's that, there's that avenue forward. And it's going to give us access now to, to Q1 to 4, but also to a number of other Kimberlites. And I haven't talked in the past a lot about the other Kimberlites lights in this field and I'm going to touch on them uh, because it's a really important component I think when we look at the project as a whole. In the more immediate term though, the important part is going to be our ability to get access to the Kimberlite to collect a much bigger bulk sample. Before I go into the logistics of how that's going to look, I do want to spend a bit of time and step back and and look at the diamond population just to sort of remind ourselves or introduce why we're, we're doing what we're doing. Um, we collected a big bulk sample in 2014. We recovered about 384 carats of diamonds. We had them valued in, in 2015 by Triple W, and we came up with a model price range, with a model low price of uh, just over $40 a carat, up to $90 a carat. And for this Kimberlite, um, we're looking at a recoverable grade of around 30 CPHT. That's not going to cut it, uh, and, and it just the product doesn't work at that sort of valuation. But it's important to keep in mind that the number one conclusion from that valuation was the fact that uh, the parcel was too small to actually properly put a value on the diamonds. Um, and the other important thing when we look at the, the parcel itself is there's there's a lot of colored stones in, in the parcel. And, uh, and those diamonds were not thought to be particularly interesting by the valuators. There's a number of questions about their ability to be polished and could they turn into, into fancy colored diamonds uh, on the polishing wheel. So, we uh, conducted a two-prong approach to, to further evaluating the project. Rather than just sort of s- s- sitting back and saying, okay, I guess we're done, we decided let's answer some of these questions. And the first part of that was a cutting and polishing exercise on some of the better colored stones. And then we also revisited the size frequency distribution of the colored diamond deposit. The cutting and polishing exercise was an unequivocal success. Uh, all of the diamonds that we polished turned into beautiful, round, brilliant diamonds. They have a very deep, fully saturated color, which is really important. We were able to have them certified by the GIA in New York as fancy, vivid, orangey, yellow diamonds. That vivid designation is really important. It means the color is fully saturated. It's the highest color grading you can get from a fancy colored stone. These, we've shown these diamonds around the jewelers. People use them in the, in the, in the very high-end luxury uh, jewelry market, and they are desirable. They would be used in, in high-end luxury jewelry. There is a market for these stones, and they're worth more than they were given credit for the valuation. So that's great. That's one component and one potential avenue for upside of these stones if we can show that there's enough of them. The other bit of work we did is we looked at the nitrogen aggregation characteristics of the diamonds in, in Q14, and I won't go into sort of the, the science of that, but the outcome of that study uh, is it showed us that the colored diamonds and the non-colored stones are clearly different populations. They're two totally different age diamond populations. There's no chance for overlap. They probably came from different areas and different levels in the Earth's mantle. And therefore, uh, the, the, the other being sort of geologically pretty cool. It shows us that it's probably most appropriate to, to do our modeling and our size frequency distribution modeling on these diamonds separately, looking at the yellow diamonds separate from the, the non-yellow diamonds. And, and when we do that, we can get plots that look like this. This is a, a, a size grade curve. Um, the longer line is the overall parcel. If we pull the yellow diamonds out of this parcel, though, it doesn't change a whole lot. So essentially, you're looking at a number of diamonds and size of diamonds on the, on the x-axis, and you get this curve. If we pull out the yellow stones, we get a much flatter curve. And the other thing that you notice is we run out of data. Uh, we don't have enough diamonds sort of greater than the 11 DTC size, or sort of a half carat or bigger, to really project what's going to happen. But if we keep that slope, a very reasonable interpretation and model uh, for sort of forward modeling exercise is that this is a course of distribution. And at some point, we're not only going to overall come up with more bigger diamonds in the deposit than we're currently giving credit for, we're proportionally going to come up with more colored diamonds than we are non- non-colored diamonds. And that could be hugely important. And if we take that model size distribution, and if we take them and, and we marry it with the, the 2015 model, so that 40 to $92 a carat model that we ended up with, we take that actual underlying data, apply it to this SFD, 
that the price range goes, instead of being 40 to 90 bucks a carat, it's sort of between 60 and 220 dollars a carat. Which, in that sort of frame, I think really means we have no idea what the value of these diamonds are. But the important thing is, once we get north of 200 bucks a carat, this project looks really, really interesting. I think a threshold price, if you're thinking that way, we probably need to see north of 150 dollars a carat overall for this deposit to really, to really work considering its location. So this exercise is totally different from the, from the polishing exercise. It does not take into account that those colored diamonds are potentially more valuable than they're given credit for in that valuation. So these are two independent paths that we have identified that show that there's, there's real potential value outside in this diamond population. So taking a look at the Kimberlite itself, this, this slide gives an idea of just the terrain, the size of the Kimberlite, it has a sort of funny horseshoe shape. That helps when we start playing around with open pit scenarios and dropping pits onto this. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the resource is about 48 million tons down to 200 meters below the surface. We have another uh, target for further exploration in our geological model. It takes it down to 300 meters, uh, which would add maybe another 15 or so million tons. And with that, model, we're still looking at our strip ratio that's less than 3 to 1. So that's a low strip ratio if you're to compare it to the mines at, at, uh, in the Lactigra region where the strip ratio could be north of 10 to 1. It's important and helps address the lower grade that this deposit has. We completed some drilling in 2017. Um, this is just an example of a couple of holes that extended well outside of the existing model, stayed in Kimberlake. Both of these holes that we're seeing in these two areas of the Kimberlake, here and right here, uh, they stay in Kimberlake for 100 meters beyond the existing geological model. And just as a reminder, so our resource cuts off right here at 200 meters below the surface. So it's a big Kimberlake, and we've, we've answered that. So really, there's no point in doing a bunch more drilling and coming up with a bigger tonnage until we sort out the valuation side of things. And the way to do that is with the bulk sample. We've targeted 10,000 tons as a reasonable sample to collect. Um, the point of the sample is to confirm the course end of the curve, so the course distribution, the, the, the size distribution of the coarser diamonds and uh, the value of the, over, of the overall value of the diamonds. Um, with the hamlet constructing a trail, we'll be able to take advantage of that to lower our cost. Um, we'll be able to take advantage of the free digging characteristics of the uh, deposit. You can see this is our little excavator we've used for our previous bulk samples. We can get a, with a row, we can get a much bigger excavator up there. We don't need to drill and last. We can just dig this Kimberlite out of the ground. Taking advantage of that, I think, is going to be hugely important. And the other thing that we're looking at and that we've announced is a, a study on a, a, an engineering design study on a processing plant. With the road there, we can look at processing the sample on site rather than taking the, the time to collect the sample that far north, put it on a bar, ship it to Montreal, ship it to a processing plant. The process would be looking at a six, eight, or 12 month delay in results for a sample of this size. If we can get a plant constructed and built on site, we can process it and essentially be getting results in real time. And the other important components, I was thinking, we've already heard about XRTs and Tomra. Tomra should have been a sponsor here, because we're, we're working with them on this sort of solution. And uh, go on a little bit of a tangent, just so that, that folks understand, I think, what this technology means and why it's different than what's been done in the past. When we talk about XRT, it's X-ray transmission. It's an optical sorting technology. Classic diamond recoveries in, in the most existing diamond mines uses a dense media separation plant. So you, you use a dense media, you come up with a concentrate, and that yield can be anywhere like around a percent or a couple of percents, and then it needs to get upgraded again, usually going through an XRS, so an X-ray flow sort, which would be another sort of acronym you might have heard in the past. And that would recover the diamonds based on the fluorescing characteristics of the diamonds. What an XRT does is it actually source the diamonds on the basis of atomic weight. And it's diamond, we're looking for carbon. So it's a kind of a perfect material to be trying to sort with this, this sort of technology because you know exactly what the atomic weight is, the specifications can be made very tight, and you can you can get the diamonds out. So the idea is you can get straight to a hand sortable concentrate straight away. And the other important component when looking at overall diamond parcels is not all diamonds fluoresce. So in a typical diamond recovery circuit, you're not going to necessarily get low fluorescing diamonds. Recoveries could be, could be uh, less effective and you'd be looking at other uh, recovery techniques like grease table and so on. So it's just a lot more components. Uh, with an XRT, you go straight to a hand sortable concentrate. And so we're looking at this as to come up with a, a portable uh, plant that we can send up the site uh, process quickly. We're only looking, in this case, to, to recover the diamonds from three millimeters and bigger. This is an exploration project. The three millimeters is about 11 ETC, it's about a half carat size. Typically in the past, for exploration projects, we spent a lot of time on our bulk samples recovering all the small diamonds, down to one millimeter often, um, sometimes even smaller. It's a lot of money that gets spent paying somebody to sort through thousands of small, tiny diamonds. They describe them, we weigh them all. 
and then the valuator takes the call it five thousand diamonds in that size class. They they cut off two hundred stones, look at them, and say, "Here's the price." In this room, we've collectively come up with a price for those diamonds, and, and it's it's not going to impact or affect the uh, the ultimate answer that we're trying to get, which is of course, are diamonds valuable enough? So yeah, the idea here is to push more sample through the plant, recover more of the coarser diamonds, get them, see them, properly evaluate those, and then we'll worry about the fine diamonds if it makes sense, and spend the money and the time and the effort on that if it makes sense. So that's kind of the, the thinking there. I've yet to have anybody tell us that we're, we're kind of nuts to be thinking that way. And I think it's, it's part of, people talk about innovation, I think it's part of a new way when money is so dear and so difficult to raise and so so tough to get and you, your your margins on your for, for sticking on budget are, are so tight. We need to look at ways as, are we spending money that we need to spend? And I think this is one way, as juniors, and on the evaluation side, we can uh, look at things and put money that doesn't necessarily need to be spent right now. So our timeline would see us uh, starting some diamond recoveries in 2020. So not this summer, but next summer. A lot of it hinges on this community access trail. Uh, I'd hope that today we'd be able to stand up and say that there's some funding in place from the, the government of the, the Northwest Territory, so the government of the router. Um, that is expected any day now for the Hound to be able to start construction uh, this summer. You can see it's following for the most part an existing ATV route. Um, the important part for us would be if the, they're completed up to kilometer 11 by uh, the end of July next summer, that could tie in well with, uh, with our plans for the processing plant, which if we come up with a solution we like, we'd be looking to, to manufacture that plant and get it shipped to site uh, and arriving in late July next year. We could start with some, some initial sampling and processing in 2020 and into 2021. I'll just show one of the, this is our lay down at the community here. There's a quarry and then there's the community. So there's the ocean. This is the lay down area that we'd be looking at to potentially putting the plant. The hamlet is very keen to see this happen. It extends our time and our visibility in the hamlet while the program is being conducted. I haven't talked a lot about the other campsites, and I have to probably do this pretty quickly now. This shows the extension of the road, and you can see where Q104 is. Off to the left, it's only a kilometer and a half from the road, but there's also another three large Kimberlites that would be within six kilometers of the road, A34, A94, and A76. And if we kind of look at this area where these Kimberlites were discovered, BHP did this work in the early 2000s. And if we take a look at, uh, at where these bodies are all located, a couple of things. On this image, you might see there's sort of a train difference. As we get to the east side of the image where the bulk of these Kimberlites have been discovered, it, it looks a little bit more washed out. And that's the impact of a marine inundation during deep glaciation. There's a lot more ocean water that washed over the east side of this image than on the other side. So we see that in the indicator mineral results in our, our indicator train. There's indicators that led BHP to this area. They drilled the Kimberlites. Uh, some obvious geophysical targets, this is the magnetic data. To my eye, there's other targets here that could get drilled, uh, that could certainly be Kimberlite. So there's not nice trains that lead right to these bodies, it's sort of a cloud of indicators, and they drill the most obvious features. If we take a look at the entire drilling database for this window, that's it. So BHP drilled a total of nine targets in this area, seven of them, of them, of them were Kimberlites. There's other features here that certainly need to get drilled. Um, that's a pretty good success ratio with an exploration drill, and there's been no drilling since then on an exploration perspective. So the focus immediately switched to the larger Kimberlites that have been found closer to the community. Just a real quick look at, uh, at a couple of these bodies. Weight 34, this next image just shows the geophysics, so mag data in the middle, resistivity, a couple of drill holes, and that's it, that's in it, and it's over 200 meters wide. Um, one of the holes ended in Kimberlite. A94 is much bigger, very similar story. These holes, you'll see, are over 300 meters long. There's just two of them. One of them colored in Kimberlite, ended in Kimberlite. There certainly is capacity for this body to be a whole lot bigger as well. And this is the kind of exploration upside that we see ultimately with this project. But our focus in the shorter term is very much on, on the bulk sample, seeing this access trail through, continuing to help and support the community with that effort to see that road completed by next summer in time for a processing plant to arrive, get constructed, initiate some sampling, probably finishing it in, in 2021. And that's certainly the upside that we see on the, expo on the exploration and other Kimberlites that we can, we can uh, make discoveries and, and just further evaluating the bodies that are there. An important thing I didn't mention, with all those Kimberlites, they're the same age as Q14, and from the indicator work, they sample the exact same amount. So they, they certainly need to be uh, have a closer look taken up. So basically, there's no other project like this in the world right now in terms of a, a project with a resource like this, exploration upside, access, and a jurisdiction where I mean, the Hamlet is, is helping us build a road up to the deposit. So obviously, there's, there's very good support there. There's no other project like this that isn't already in the hands of, uh, at least in some way, with, uh, with an operator, in, in our view. 
just a couple of slides on the market. This is a slide of uh, Canadian Junior Explorers. Um, it'll be an ongoing theme through today, and, and these sorts of comparisons of market capitalization are always fraught, and there's always lots of arm waving and, and uh, that is required. My main point with this is the market over the last six months, Junior Explorers have been converging on a single market capitalization of about five million bucks, give or take a couple million. And that's regardless of assets in the company, it's regardless of number of assets, quality of assets, location of assets, whether there's resources and there's actually carrots in the ground, it doesn't matter, everybody's converging. The one sort of outlier I point to would be Star, and we heard about that earlier, and, and, uh, and they got a real lift bringing in a partner in Rio. The work is underway, it's happening, and they're getting much more recognition of that now in the market, and that's where we've positioned, or have a position, but certainly I think it's a position that North will find itself in right now as a, as a junior explorer, there certainly is upside and we can make a similar argument when we look at producers, obviously a lot more differences there, but from $5 million market capitalization, um, I think the point is that there's, there's really only, only one way to go, and particularly in a company with an asset like we have in Q14 and that jurisdiction, and, and I've covered all that, we've been successful in finding Kimberlites. We're going to have exposure with Dominion on uh, drilling in July. We'll be doing more work on our Loki project in the Latin Tigra region uh, this summer as well, but our focus is on, on this resource in Q14 and getting this bulk sample collected. So that's, uh, that's everything. Uh, if I could, just before to, to maybe lighten the mood a little bit, I don't know if there's going to be sound with this or not. I uh, mentioned our, our work we've done with the Hamlet, um, and one of the things that we've been working on with the Hunters and Trappers organization is just taking a look at, at caribou and wildlife in the region. This is like a 30 second slide here that, uh, that Nick Thomas, my colleague, who works with community relations, and is, is a really key part of why our, our relations are so, uh, so, so good with the Hamlet. This is, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is about a year's worth of, of shots in our, our uh, one of our wildlife cameras. So this would be a, a shot a day. Oh, wow. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> 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 you can see, I mean, the land is huge. It's, uh, you know, we're right there in the, the Hamilton, but they're keen to get access. And, and then a blizzard happens. <laughs> so that's it. But thanks very much, everyone. For